Welcome back to the Belfry Hockey Podcast, Season 2, Episode 11 now of, uh, of this string that we're on as it relates to the book Belfry Offense. And today I want to dig into rotational speed and just general skating off the puck in the offensive zone. I think that this is a really cool topic because I think it's largely misunderstood by players. I think coaches, by for the most part, they know exactly what they want to see as it relates to movement off the puck. But I find that a lot of players are really torn as to when to move and why and, and what all what all that encompasses and where the timings are and the triggers to movement. And so I think it's going to be a good topic to see if we can uh, we can make some inroads into what movement off the puck is and, and why. So let's start with the defenseman. So in the offensive zone, defensemen who move well off the puck, a lot of times what we think about is them moving, like diving down on the offensive blue line. So weak side D, recognizing that the weak side defensive forwards not exactly paying attention maybe as their skates turn to the corner or the puck and their back is to them so now they sneak down on the back side so that's one or you have like the weak side pinch that's skating off the puck as well puck gets rimmed around and now it's a foot race to get to the to get the puck to keep the puck in so we understand that sort of stuff but where the real nuances are are the weak side defenseman understanding how to get down to the short porch. So I call it the short porch, but it's like the in if you live in Canada, you're familiar with the ringette line, which ringette is a sport in Canada where uh, where there's a line that goes directly across a red line directly across the top of the circles, um, and Oftentimes we refer to that ringette line when we're talking in, in hockey and use it as a geographical marker. But in the U.S., there, you don't see that. It's, you don't see the ringette line. We just call it the top of the circle. So the short porch is basically the top of the circles, and it it's, allows you to kind of better define the high slot. So the weak side defenseman should be surfing down there when they don't have the puck so if the puck is on you know the right in the right corner and the left d the weak side defenseman in my mind that defenseman needs to be surfing down there there's two reasons for that N number one so surfing let's start with what surfing actually is so surfing is forward skating and you would start like at the blue line, but then you would skate forwards on a bit of an arc coming down to where that weak side defensive forward is. And then if the puck were to come up to the blue line to your strong side defenseman, this defense, this weak side defenseman would then back pedal to the blue line and make themselves available to their partner. Now the value also of this surfing is multi there's a multitude of reasons the one you're already gapped properly to stretch forward so if the other team gets the puck and they're looking to break out and the weak side forward their weak side forward is key to their breakout in some way either they're going to come around and they're going to go to the use the weak side so now that the forward is going to go to the boards and be a breakout option well now you're already right there there's no is you're not really pinching you're right on top of this situation because you're already there so now you're over so now you're effectively with your movement off the puck and sprinting off the puck you're essentially controlling their ability to break out so if you could imagine you're the defenseman coming around the net and you take a look and all of a sudden that that winger that you want to pass to is no longer available because we've taken them away because our weak side defensive forwards all over them that's going to impact the way that you break out you can't use that player you might have to use the middle you might have to extend the possession yourself you might have to turn back so that defensive uh, the de the weak side defenseman is controlling the breakout by their use of the surf so that's number one now they could also that defensive forward who now is going to be the slash forward so now they recognize that there's been a change of possession 
Now they're sprinting off the puck to come out into the neutral zone. Many, 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 many coaches really like a slashing forward. In my mind, I prefer the forward to go straight up the ice first and then come over to the strong side, to, like to that side. I don't like the angle already cutting across because I think you invite a weak side fold, which is very popular in uh, being able to kill the rush defense. It's a very good rush defense play is a weak side fold. You're basically making it easy on them because you're already sprinting over there. I get my defensive weak side defensive for uh, defenseman. They're already surfing. You take off. They just mirror you all the way out and they kill the play. You're going into small space. That's a real tough play for that slashing forward all of a sudden. Now it's slash forward when they do that and the defenseman doesn't go with you and there's no weak side fold. Well, now you know, you're looking to pick up a chip and you're hoping that maybe the 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 strong side defenseman has held the blue line and you're able to chip it by and now you're in a one-on-one -on -one against the weak side D. Fair enough. And a lot of teams, that's a good play. But against a team like the way I want to play, I'm coming over with my weak side defenseman all day long. They're going to be attached. You'd be lucky if you touch the puck. Like they're going to be all over you. They're going to kill that thing before it even gets started. Because I want my guy sprinting off the puck because I want to kill that. I don't want to be defending any longer than I have to. So that's another way. The other thing that the weak side defensive, uh, the weak side offensive defenseman, the reason that they surf down is because now they can sit on the on the back of that weak side defensive forward and they can do one of two things. They could jump to the inside. And they could be more high slot shot support for passes that come through the middle of the ice. So if we were to rotate our high our high forward to the net and on our weak side or our, our net front D or net, net front forward, sorry, pops out, we could have our weak side D slide into that space that was vacated by F3. And now we're in a we're in a really dangerous position offensively to capitalize so there's that and then it could also go off your back and head to the back post uh, in a more traditional activation what i don't want from my weak side defenseman is that they just standing at the offensive blue line growing roots that doesn't show any level of understanding of how to move off the puck there's no hockey sense required there they're just basically waiting and these are the types of players that get victimized over and over and over again by bad pinches. They get beat by standing still and the slash forward is able to get puck. And now we have to defend in the D zone or worse, give up a shot off the off the rush. That weak side defensive forward, the more inactive they are, the more they're vulnerable to counter. And the more active they are in being able to understand the timing. And it takes time. Like you're going to get beat. You're gonna get beat a few times because you've mismanaged the spacing. You don't understand. You're not re watching the puck, so you don't notice when the puck turns over. Next thing you know, slashing forward takes off. Now you're losing the race. Boom! They chip it off the glass. That guy's gone. Yeah, that's gonna happen. That's the price of doing business, though, in the learning curve. And then after a few times that that happens, you learn to adjust. The defensive for the uh, the the defenseman weak side defenseman starts to learn how to play above they figure out some of the space like it takes time once they figure that out though that is a major competitive advantage in your ability to move off the puck and that's what's that's what's important here now let's talk about the the interaction between f3 and the net front forward so we've talked about this a little bit before when we talked about the highway so i won't repeat myself you, you, I'm sure you're familiar with my thoughts on the F3 and the and the interaction in between and the relationship between the net front forward and F3. What I want to talk about now is the reloading sprinting off the puck that's that's important with the three forwards. So I don't want it personally. I don't like an offensive zone that is static. I don't like people standing still. I certainly, I don't like, and oftentimes what happens to what I would consider to be a relatively uh, 
unsophisticated offensive zone, what you'll see is the weak side defenseman is standing still at the blue line. You'll also see F3 standing still. And then you'll also see the net front forward standing still at the net. So you have the three guys in the middle of the ice all standing still. That makes it difficult to have a dynamic offensive zone because you have three of your five people are now basically playing defense. They're, they're not doing anything. They're not, they're not really contributing uh, in the way that I want them to contribute. I want that net front forward to be active in side change. I want them to be active in using the weak side dot as on a, on a re release and replace. I want that F, F3 forward to be rotating and sprinting. Now, the difference in the way that I like the offensive zone is if you're F3, you're sprinting to get above. I need you to get above because we need to have layers because I don't really know what my, what my defensemen might see and what type of or what level of activity that they might need and so the more you are as an F3 are providing that sprinting to get reloaded, the more comfort that we all have to and our defensemen have to be active and get moving off, off the line. So as much as there's interaction between the net front to forward and your F3, there is also an interaction between your F3 and your weak side defenseman. So that whole, that's a chain that is really important. And F3 is, is the, like they're connecting both of those two people and in that line, they're the connective tissue. And so F3 needs to be reloading all the time because if we know that F3 is constant, they're gonna get above, they're gonna provide a protective shield for our defensemen, then our defensemen can play with much more instinct, which is what I want. I want the defensemen not to worry about what might happen because when they start look, oh, is F three there? And they start look when they start looking and checking and double checking, they're hesitating. Anytime you hesitate, you're gonna lose a half a step. That's all you need to get chipped on. So I want to eliminate hesitation by having people rotate properly. And so one of the first uh, things that I think needs to be built in an offensive zone is side change rotation. First, number one thing, side change rotation. You need to understand how the three forwards are gonna be able to change sides and the different ways they can change sides. There's a couple things that are really important. Number one, the net guy, net front guy, needs to be able to change sides using the back of the net. So the puck gets rimmed to the back. They can get, grab it on the back. They understand how to preserve space. They're going to be able to keep their feet moving and they can come out on the other side. That's number one. And then we need to understand how our F3 is going to interact with that particular side change and what, what all is entailed. Because a lot of times on that side change, the most dangerous guy in the ice is the weak side D coming downhill into a, into a one-timer as the guy emerges from the back he can pass it up, and uh, and if we're going to capitalize on the rotation on the rotation of the defense and be able to find that guy on that side. So where's our F three go? Well, F three, if he's going to come here, then F three is going to come in uh, over the top of that and be, provide the pr protection, allowing our F our, our defenseman to make that read, get down there and and be available offensively. The next one in rotation is F3 side change. So this time the puck comes maybe a little harder around. F3 now dives down, gets below the dot, picks up the puck in the corner and is now coming up the wall. So it bypasses the net front guy and F3 is gonna go on that side change. Now, how are we gonna rotate? Where does the net front guy go? How does our D interact with that? So that's the second piece. Then the next one is the puck goes, it's a, it's a weak side release. So our puck carrier who's on the strong side, they hard rim it to the backside 
Now our D is coming down onto that puck, and they're keeping the play alive, coming down the wall. And there's a lot of different things that they can do in that situation. So you know they can go down and go into the puck, keep you know bumping it back behind the net, or you know carrying it off the wall, or turning up and all that kind of stuff. Or as they go down the wall and the puck is coming, they can turn up with it and now roll up into the elbow. Again, F3 really important here in that rotation of getting into that into that space as our weak side D vacates that spot, they're going to come in and provide that support there. So, And then we have to have someone landing on the net. We have to have a, a new F3 rotating up. we got to get people above their people. So if we lose the race or we lose a board battle or whatever the case may be, we have people above and we're in a good position to kill the opposition's exit. If we don't kill it, we at least want to control it slow it down, not allow them to get any momentum through the neutral zone that we're going to have to do. I don't want to defend any speed through the neutral zone. I want to, the best time to kill speed is before it gets fast. So that's why I want to get, do all this early. And the more movement you have in your rotational speed and the more movement you have in the offensive zone, the easier it is to discourage speed because you're going to get quicker on top of them before they get organized. So that's the value of playing at a higher rate than the opponent. When your speed collectively between your weak side defensemen surfing, your weak side or your um, your F3 who's now rotating up, he comes up and then it's not there, he goes down to the net or he is going on a on a rim rim release he's coming up to go down and then someone else is as he's going down someone is, else is coming up so it's constantly he's getting replaced either by the net guy or whatever so what happens is is that you're now playing at a higher rate of speed than the defenseman and the defensive group so that's going to allow you to one win more loose pucks two if you lose a loose puck, you're going to be able to contest it much more into a traditional 50-50. Or you're going to be able to force them to have to move a puck before they, they're they organized to do so. And so, again, all those are control game control factors, which is ultimately what r- the rotation speed is all about. So sprinting off the puck and moving in a purposeful way it really matters because it allows you to control the game much more effectively. So when offensive players, the more unsophisticated they are in their understanding, they start to learn soft ice. So coach says, okay, we're going to learn soft ice. So you're going to go on the strong side in the pie of the circle. So if you look at the end zone circle there, and you, you know, split it into four like a pie, the pie, the higher, higher kind of triangle that's uh, above the top of this, uh, above the hash marks on the inside, that's basically where the soft ice is. It's kind of in that spot. It's referred to as soft ice because it's difficult to defend. There's no real person that's kind of responsible for that area. So it gets this like soft area and it's typically used to generate shots. Um, you can also use it as a re- as a release area on the strong side. So um, where, you know, your F3 uh, might move to the dot and now they're a dot release for on the strong side. Um, and so that's another one that's really important. That's another value of your F of your uh, weak side, uh, weak side defenseman is they can be. Uh, support for the dot release so when the puck goes into the dot that guy could go cross dot to dot to a down a guy uh, the weak side defenseman coming down on that puck another very dangerous play on uh, offensively so the the a whole idea is surrounding learning soft ice the issue with that is Players want to hang around in that spot. They know it's a dangerous offensive spot. If they're a good shooter, they get there and they want to hang around there. And fair enough. Problem is, the longer you stay there, the less like now you're stopped. 
once you're stopped, you're losing the value of what we really need, which is game control. So yes, you're in the right position, but because you're stopped, you're not in motion, you're not in a, in a you're not uh, focused on timing. What ends up happening is you are now an exit kill liability because you're standing still. So we want to have rotation. You rotate into the soft ice, you move into it, you have good timing for the puck carrier so that when they get it, that you're available. If you don't get the puck, you're going to continue through to the net or to the next uh, the next support spot and someone else is then rotating into that that position. So you could also vacate this position. Our weak side defenseman could slide into that spot and now they're available. So it's those types of plays that start to come available as your team learns to the the there's rotational speed but it's not everybody moving like crazy fast all the time. It's one guy's moving fast, the other guy's decelerating. Now as that guy vacates the area, he's decelerating. A new guy is accelerating into that space. Then when they get to in the space, they decelerate in the space to elongate the amount of time in which they're in that area. Now they're available for the puck carrier. All this, the puck doesn't come. Time is not there. They vacate that space. And a new player is coming through. That's, that's rotation and rotational speed. And, and what you need to do is teach that timing. It's not get there and stop. It's get there at the right time, decelerate, get your feet set in a good spot where you have playing with expectation to get the puck and shoot it or make the next play. And then we're out of there. We're on to the next play. Part of the other value of that, and this is why I don't like, but particularly when you see the beginnings of using F3 offensively which you know a lot of times like when kids are young they don't use f3 because they don't want to pass it to anybody they're basically going one-on-one in the corner walkouts wraparounds all that kind of stuff they don't pass to f3 all of a sudden though you start teaching that the soft ice and now pucks are starting to come in there now guys start standing there hoping waiting growing roots and that's also a problem so now we're trying to catch this timing thing and teaching the timing and, and how the, it's Excel to decel to Excel into the next into the next position. And part of what you're really teaching is move to the next spot. So you wherever the next spot is, you're moving into the next spot and then you rotate out of there and then you're into the next spot. And then sometimes the D is getting involved and so then now you cover for the D and then you become F3 and then you get the guy at the net and now you're the guy in the corner and you keep changing roles. So the real value of learning rotation and why rotational speed and teaching it, and this is something you have to teach. Like, you know, you want to have players really understand how this works so that they can then apply their instinct to it. And I think this is where the coaching can really come in and good coaching get really shows up on teams where you have this, and you have kids that are pretty instinctual, and they make some good, they make some good uh, plays. The problem is, is like a play is only as good as other people around. A play is amongst other people. And this is where, you know, I see a lot of small area games that are, you know, like the net is not where it's supposed to be. It's like somewhere crazy in the zone, could be in the corner, could be at the top of the circle, could be wherever. And it these markings or these areas of the ice are not being utilized. And I would argue that when people are not where they're supposed to be in terms of the timing of arriving into space, you're not really you're the best you're gonna hope for in a small area game that the net is not where it's supposed to be and you don't have the natural geographical dimensions and ice markings and areas of the ice where it's all supposed to be, the best you can hope for is give and go. That's really what you're working on. So that is an important skill. I don't want to de diminish that. And it's a good game to play when they're young or it's a good game as a starter game but you got to evolve out of that because we need players 
in the games to learn how to use the ice markings and to learn how to rotate with timing and speed. So this whole idea of having two nets in the zone and having a small area game, you go from one to the other, to the other, to the other, and you have all these like move the net here, it's three on three, and now it's two versus one, or it's three versus four, or whatever the case may be, and you have all these like this guy standing in the corner and he's only a passer over here, and this guy's over here and he's only a passer over there. Like honestly, you're getting creative, but you ain't accomplishing a hell of a lot. It's really not that valuable. And I can think of a hundred more ways to deconstruct a game in which we utilize the ice markings in the proper way so that you can learn rotation and timing and the things that actually matter as it relates to this instinctual stuff. When players are not where they're supposed to be and they just play wherever, they're just like move to space. Like one of the terms that drives me completely crazy is, well, just move to space. What are we? What are you talking about? Move to space. I don't want you just to move to space or move to get open. That's not what we're trying to do here. We need you to move into the right space at the right time for the right reason. That's what we need you to do. It's not just move to space. And now I got people, you know, flipping passes into open space, and and we're calling that offense. No, that's a game, great, and there's some value. I can't discount it completely, but my, you want to talk about a waste of time. Run four games in the offensive zone and have the nets in all different spaces. And this, and I'm talking like high-level hockey above 12 years old. Run four games in the offensive zone put the nets wherever you want or put restrictions of like this guy can only be in this corner and pass from here. That's completely crazy in my opinion if you really want to learn offense. That's not offense. Like I said, the best you can get to is move to space, you know, uh, and it's give and go and learning how to like control the puck. Fair enough. Those are all important skills. But if we're talking about real offense... We got to have the net where it's supposed to be and we got to have players rotating and moving with a purpose to get onto things on time and learn the timing of arriving and that in, in, in the right space. That's real puck support and offense. I don't want someone just moving to open space. It's a little ridiculous. What I want is them moving to a space that matters. They're moving for a purpose for the next play. And the games that I'm talking about are great. They're just lead up to this. If you're if you're going to do these types of games, great. The next game after that has to be something where the net is where it's supposed to be and you're building into these things. Otherwise, we're not really teaching and we're not really providing an opportunity for learning in an elite offensive mind way, which is a dis which is which is a shame because we should be exposing our athletes to that. So that's my rant on that, and and I have a lot of things to say about that whole situation and how what like, what we think really matters and how it really translates. Obviously, but what I really want to get to is the value of rotation in the offensive zone and understanding the interaction between how two players move together for a purpose to create a competitive advantage. That's what I really want to get to. And it's those types of things that I think we got to focus on and expose our players to so that more of them can understand how that works and then start applying their instinct to that.